Welcome back to Love, Life, and Legacy, the podcast dedicated to helping you navigate these hypersexualized times of ours. That's a great opening. I mean, I say it now, and I realize that when I think about it, I can't say it because it's so subconscious and automatic, but I like it. This is really a show that helps you navigate these crazy hypersexualized times. Things are changing rapidly. Not for the better, not just yet. Uh, when, when our culture becomes really strong, and when we become solid as a community, like really, really solid, which I believe is 2024, this is a game changing year, then we will start to push back against this really decaying culture. And so luckily we have a great captain and captainette in terms of our founders who are rock solid in who they are and what they're willing to do day after day after day in order to allow High Noon to expand. And I'm talking about none other than the Wolfenberger couple, Uncle Dave and M. Mitsue. And today I have Uncle Dave on the podcast just to catch up. You know, it's really important that we understand where he's coming from because this, <laughs> he's got a lot on his shoulders in order to make this happen. And so to kind of pick his brain a little bit is really important. But what ended up happening in this conversation was really beautiful because he started to unpack some very inspiring details about his marriage and how his marriage is his superpower. His blessing is what gives him the ability to do all that he does. It's really inspiring. If you're single and you're looking for motivation about the blessing, by golly gosh, you found it. It's this episode. If you are blessed, and you want to level up in some way, shape, or form, by goodness gracious, listen to this episode. It's Fentrasmic. Let's get into it. All right, everybody. We are here live with the man, with the guy. El Jefe, they call him in regions of this world. He is the big boss man. He's Uncle David Wolfenberger. Thanks for coming. Stopping by, Uncle Dave. Thank you, Sammy. It's a pleasure being here. No problem. I'm Sammy today. I like it. Uh, oh, <laughs> <laughs> we get Andrew. confused all the time, you know. I'm a tall, half Asian. It's okay. Um, so this is special because normally this time of year you are completely out of reach. You are in kind of work mode, but this is the first year that you were even hinting at the fact that you can show up for meetings this year. So. Is this the first time in High Noon's existence that you, you could do something like this, have the bandwidth to do a podcast at this time of year? Well, last year was our was our busiest year ever by far. Uh, it was like 50% more crowd than our busiest year in 35 years. Mm. And I did not have, <clears throat> I didn't have any extra time last year. I'm sorry I ghosted you, Andrew. <laughs> For about two months, two or three months. I just ran in circles crying for two months. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I promised that this year I wouldn't do that and I would challenge and it. Um, I think it's going to work out okay. So you are a great example of somebody who doesn't back down from a challenge. Um, where did that come from? Have you always been like that? Like since you were a little kid? Were you okay with being challenged? Is that how you were raised or where did that come from? I think I had a rebellious nature. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds familiar. In what that's, way? Uh, that's part of it, yeah. Okay. Is it like a sense of you can't tell me what to do, I'll show you this kind of feeling? Like I'll 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 prove myself. Yeah, yeah. I always uh I always did work better in my own business, even I had a, my own business when I was uh, 16 years old, I hired my friends and I contracted houses to paint. <laughs> really? I think the most I had, the longest I had a job before the church was like uh, maybe three months at a hardware store. <laughs> <laughs> what happened at the end of those three months? Oh, I don't know. I, I left. Yeah. Your it rebellious nature me. kicked in probably. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's a lot of, that's kind of like a prerequisite for leadership in many ways is you're a leader of something because you notice that something's not quite what it could be. And so 
you lead what could be considered a rebellion. In a in a sense, our movements are rebellion against status quo, right? Um, I mean, mm. Family Federation, it was like, we didn't just engraft ourselves to another pre-existing faith. We etched out our own space. I mean, True Parents did because what was happening wasn't true enough, wasn't good enough. And High Noon also seems like an extension of that. Uh, you created something because there's nothing that existed and that was quite good enough. Yeah. Yeah. There was a huge need and, and that need wasn't being met at all. Uh, mm. uh, not just in our church in the, in the Christian church and the uh, broader society, really very few people were talking about this. Yeah. You know, what's crazy is when we started high noon, there's really, nothing online like brave hearts was an anomaly and now there's so many programs something like individuals and different it's pretty wild to see that's not a long time to see a, such a proliferation take place yeah yeah we were in on the ground floor for sure it's crazy and so i i, I felt at that time andrew that i felt uh you know any any years or months that we lose now uh you know, we won't get that back. And I felt, you know, like we were, uh, I don't know if you've ever saw It's a Wonderful Life, but uh, George's buddy, he says, uh, George, I want you to invest everything you got in plastics, this new thing called plastics. Mm -hmm. And and then later on, uh, he, he kids George because I told you, George, uh, you know, you should have invested on this. And, you know, yeah. he's coming in with a big Cadillac and stuff and uh, <laughs> flaunting as well. And I felt, you know, this is really the time. Nobody, nobody's aware of this stuff that, you know, people are just totally oblivious to uh, what's happening to young people. Hmm. And uh, so it was, it was really a calling. Yeah. And we heeded that call. And that's yeah. kind of, so this is a, like an update episode, start of the year. And we've been at this, you mentioned recently that this, we're going into our ninth year in April, right? And so it's been kind of quite the journey. And every year we have to see what we're doing with fresh eyes and come at it with fresh energy. Um, but I'd love to kind of dig into start starting with last year. What were some noteworthy developments that you saw taking place last year that you'd like to mention? Well, we identified uh, especially the demographic uh, that we really wanted to hone in on was young adults. Mm -hmm. And so we created uh, young adult workshops. We took them all over America. Mm -hmm. Then we took them all over Europe. Yeah. Right? Yep. Yeah. And then Central America. Mm. Yeah, that was that was a big one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, how do you think that went? So that, you know, we started those types of workshops as a hypothesis that um, if we did something more immersive and we got participants to participate more by having deep conversations, by revealing themselves, they would be able to experience at least some form of the high noon culture. Do you feel like that was a success? And do you feel like it was translated to the different cultures that we went to? Because you went to Costa Rica and Dominican Republic. You went to, uh, we we all went to Europe. We did this in Korea even. We did it even in Japan. Do you think it was a success? Was it what you thought it was going to be or, yeah? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and we found that Everywhere we go, young people, doesn't matter where they're from, European, Asian, uh, Latin American, they all have the same dreams and aspirations. Uh, they all want a, a beautiful marriage, wonderful family, and they all have the same challenges too. So, you know, we found that, uh, we, we found that everywhere we went. And yeah, what you said about the immersive, nature of the the workshop um i think that what we're trying to do is to make 
heavenly sexuality something normal to talk about, something that we we shouldn't be ashamed of. Uh, we're trying to create that kind of a culture. And when we uh, are able to get young people to participate in conversations about that, then it's just really amazing. I was uh, I was on a call yesterday, actually, uh, a young man who just started his family, just had his three day ceremony about uh, about a month ago. He wanted to talk to me. He wanted to know how to please his wife. And he felt that was really important. He he'd read some of father's words in core of the universe about how important it is for a woman to experience orgasm. Hmm. And so I thought that was so beautiful. Uh, you know, uh, him reaching out to me and also his wife spoke with Mitzway oh, wow. uh, afterwards. And that's just such a beautiful culture that we're creating. Hmm. I don't think that kind of thing ever happened before. Yeah. Pro not in a, like an international community. No, I could imagine you know, back in the day in a really healthy family, a tribe, when people lived closer to their family. And, you know, even here, I'm in Vietnam and there's three generation households all over the place. I would hope that some of the families at least are are passing on this wisdom, but it's extremely rare, first of all. And the fact that I'm guessing this person called from another country, oh, I just triggered some, uh, is really a product of, this new era that we live in, that somebody could call an uncle halfway around the world and get that intimate feeling that they listen to, you know, that you're listening to their needs and that you're willing to offer your heart and your wisdom. That's like, that's unbelievably special, you know, that we have this international family that can do that. Yeah. This young man, he really didn't want to become that kind of man and that kind of couple when he was like 65 years old and not ever knowing if his, if his wife ever experienced the same thing he experienced during mm -hmm. sex, he didn't want to be like that. You know, I really applaud somebody like that. Yeah. That's so healthy. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's something I, I wish upon everybody, right. That feeling of um, having a vision and, and feeling like you can talk to somebody about it and that they can actually help you. That is so wild, especially in terms of relationships. Mm -hmm. Most people are trying to figure it out by themselves for one reason or another. And you never find the answers out by yourself because you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> you got to talk to somebody about it. So yeah, it was so cool that he reached out to you. And do you love receiving those calls, Uncle Dave? Oh, I think it's so cool. It, it's just so beautiful. And Mitzi does too, you know, we prayed before and afterwards at the beginning and end of the call mm -hmm. and uh, just, yeah, it's such a, such a bond uh, that, that we create with people like that. And, you know, uh, you've got those kind of people that you talk to. Yeah. It's a beautiful bond. Mm -hmm. So it keeps you alive. I mean, as the person who receives those calls, that's another thing, like uh, anybody out there listening who is afraid of calling somebody, oh, I don't want to inconvenience them, whatever. No, when you receive a call from somebody who's looking for some help and they're entrusting you with kind of the intimate details of their lives, it's such an honor actually. And it keeps us alive. Getting those calls, right, Uncle Dave? Like it's life-giving for us and for them. That's just how humans are meant to live is ask questions and to be asked questions and to share information like that. It's what makes things fresh again, you know? That's the the joy of like living in time and space is as you get older, you kind of live vicariously through other people. Like I don't need to potty train again, but when I potty train my kid, it's like I'm learning all over again through them. It's same with sexuality is like to be a young couple again, right, Uncle Dave? To be a brand new <laughs> couple and just finishing a three-day ceremony is, it's never going to happen to us, but we can enjoy the beauty and the freshness of their love by sharing with them, by talking with them. It's really natural. That's, that's so true, Andrew. Like when you have your first child or any of your children, when you teach them things, it's like 
it's like you're learning that for the first time with them, you know, yeah. it's yeah. so real. So it's, it brings back so many memories and, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, you're just experiencing it with the next. And that's really what God's lineage is all about. I feel, mm -hmm. you know, passing on that kind of tradition, that kind of knowledge and heart from one mm -hmm. generation to the other. Yeah. Yeah. That's the great wisdom of generational wealth is talking to each other from one generation to the other. It's like learning how to live life because somebody's already made a ton of mistakes that you don't have to make. So mm, yep. that's really cool. And in the area of sex, again, it's usually everybody just uh, trying to figure it out for themselves, making the same mistakes, coming to the same conclusions. It's so useless and futile. So you call, talk to somebody, everybody out there, please talk to somebody. It doesn't have to be us, but Uncle Dave just said he loves those calls. Um, but yeah, reach out to somebody. I got a, actually a text from somebody today, this morning, who is in a bit of a dark place and I've known him for a while and he goes to these places sometimes. And he was saying that, um, when he's in that dark place, he knows he should reach out to somebody on a deep level. He knows it, but his fear and his shame tried to tell him that, Oh, you're just going to be bothering. It's a, you don't want to be an inconvenience. It's these excuses that are born out of not good emotions and not the emotions that you want to be leading your life. So everybody, please reach out to somebody. Talk to them about your questions. That's how you find out answers is by asking good questions to people. So uh, anything else from last year, Uncle Dave, that stands out? Um, um, yeah, I think uh, we built a lot of, really good relationships with leaders, especially mm. in Latin America, Philippines, and Japan. Yeah. And based on those relationships, we we established chapters in those places as well as, as Europe. Um, so that was really an accomplishment so because we've been trying to figure this out, how to, uh, what a chapter would look like. And I think it was really important that we that we put the horse before the cart and made good relationships with the leaders there first. Yeah. So in the past, just from my experience, Uncle Dave, the topic of chapters was very loose and informal, kind of like, yeah, we'll just have a person here, a person there. They can kind of, I don't know, represent us in some way, shape, or form. And then we went from that casual conversation to we're going to make chapters. They're going to be like, like real full-time ambassadors, like, and then we just ran with it and we found them and it was a lot of work. <laughs> it was a lot of work. <laughs> was it? And that was, was a really lot you, Andrew, that was, that was really you. Uh, you wanted to have seven chapters this year. Yes. You know, what's funny is we don't necessarily have a chapter in America yet, but we haven't figured out what that means. But um, what, what did, what did it, meet your expectations or did it exceed them or did it was it confusing the whole idea of wanting chapters because you're a visionary right um and as a visionary sometimes it's amazing to watch your vision unfold and other times i'm sure as a visionary it's confounding to see the <laughs> the difference between what you envisioned and the reality so in terms of your vision of chapters and the reality what how did it match up or well I I think I'd be a fraud if I said that uh, if I ever said that uh, what we're doing exceeded my expectations <laughs> <laughs> because I have really really high expectations. <laughs> I yeah I really uh, we want to restore the world through sex, you know. So uh, did I know what a chapter was going to look like? not the foggiest remember we we were toying with that and um yeah we we had a lot of thoughts but really uh nothing concrete until this year mm. yeah that was wild it went from nothing to something very quickly mm -hmm. yeah. cool manifestation everybody so 
what was uh were there any like stressful points of last year or any anything that happened last year that was like uh challenging that you weren't expecting or maybe you were expecting some challenges with leaderships uh mm -hmm. they were unexpected yeah and i think we met them with with patience and we worked through it um i think as far as challenges Always, I think maintaining our vision for the ideal of sexual integrity mm -hmm. uh, is the biggest challenge for for us each as individuals and for High Noon mm -hmm. and for the church, for that matter, sure. the entire church. Uh, well, let's... That's the one thing that can really sink us. You know, if we don't, if we compromise on that or we we get it wrong, it can really sink us, I think. Absolutely. And we have no foundation, right? To mm -hmm. be anything. What well, let's let's talk about leadership for a bit without, you know, going crazy. But I think it's important to unpack this because we are, high noon is a an experiment, right? It's an experiment that is very unique, and we're trying to play this game as well as possible, which is we are an independent nonprofit that's funded by founders, by Uncle David and Mitzway Wolfenberger, um, largely. And um, so we have independence. But the people that we want to serve are all within FFWBU internationally. And so in order to do what we would like to do, it means talking to members, and every country has a different way that you are or aren't allowed to talk to members, right? And so we're kind of playing this high level international game of trying to help people individually, but we have to go through organizations in order to get through that. So what were some challenges that showed up with leadership? Just so that people can understand what we're dealing yeah, with. Yeah, I think- we're, we're playing a very difficult game actually. Well, I think what you're describing, Andrew, is we are a, grassroots organization which is working in a top-down structure <laughs> <laughs> sure. and so yeah and so some people that they you know like wow uh, i've never we've never seen anything like this before you know yeah. <laughs> uh our, and they they are sometimes they're afraid that we're rogue that we might be um you know a road a rogue organization uh, mm -hmm. like we've seen a lot of those recently. Yes. And so they have that, uh, some of them, especially whose communities have been devastated and divided by, uh, some of the, uh, some of the schisms in our church, sure. they're a little bit cautious and that's, uh, I can understand that. Yeah. And I also think it's in in many ways it's short term frustrating, but long term I think it's ultimately benefited us as well, because it forces us to be clear about who we are and how we connect with our international family. Because a lot of people talk about politics in the church, but realistically speaking, politics arise anytime there's people in groups, because you have to have some sort of structure of how decisions are made and how to move or not move. And so it's an, an inevitability. Um, but we've, in in terms of like, I've observed you. If, if, if it was just me at this point in my life, without you involved, meeting with leaders of different kind of varieties, I think we would be in a much, much worse place than we are because I'm much more fiery tempered and you're much more able to think about the long-term mission and deal with criticisms in ways that I presently struggle with, right? So- I, th I think you might be in an, in an Albanian jail if it wasn't for me, Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, yeah. I would be in Siberia. Instead of being blessed with a Mongolian, I'd just be in a jail in Siberia somewhere, for sure. Yeah. There are a few times at the airports where- uh... <laughs> We were going through there. <laughs> I'd be a referee between you and the uh, the people going on the plane. <laughs> <laughs> My God, yes, I'm learning a lot about patience from Uncle Dave, like on a very deep level. 
I've got to say, you know, the very first time I observed this phenomena was we just finished our first huge event. We, you poured so much money into this. In addition to what you had already put into High Noon, you put into this event. We put collectively thousands of hours into organizing this thing. It was a resounding success. And we finished, like shake hands, hug, everybody's happy, go straight into a meeting in the venue and just get reamed out by some leader who wasn't attending anything, who had very strong opinions that were based on thin air because they weren't in the meeting or in the in the workshop about, about us and about this. And I could feel my body vibrating, okay? I want you all to understand that I'm like a chihuahua that just gets really upset. And I wanted, I kept on looking, glancing at the exit door because I was going to storm out. I could envision it. I was going to say something or just yell it out and then storm out like a hot-headed idiot. But instead, I averted my eyes and focused on Uncle Dave and remembered I represent him. If I do something stupid, then he does something stupid. So I was just watching him. The entire time, he was taking all these criticisms. At the very end of the meeting, he didn't say anything. He got up and walked over and shook this leader's hand and said, thank you so much. And it was sincere. It wasn't sarcastic at all. And I was just like, oh, damn, I got a lot of growth. <laughs> I got to grow a lot more. And I've observed this countless times. And this happened last year. And, and with these leaders, we had a few tough leadership meetings where we were just being criticized for stuff that we didn't do. And ultimately, it came out. The truth came out, as it tends to. Um, and the entire time, while we were being falsely accused, you didn't lash back. You 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 really absorbed it. And it's would you call that grace? What would you call that? Patience? What is that virtue? I think it's patience. I think it's also, you know, we've always wanted to, we've always made a lot of effort to stay aligned with, with Heavenly Father, Heavenly Parents, and with True Mother. Yeah. And, uh, you know, being humble to the leadership is, is part of that. Um, something that really inspired me um, that Damien said uh, last week on the TribeNet call was that True Mother wants her like primary metric is to have healthy, uh, healthy, happy young people and healthy and happy second gen, healthy and happy blessings. And I thought that was, that is just so cool. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that is, it's the metric that we're not going to discover right away where, you know, if we did it, it's going to, it takes years. Yeah. Maybe a generation. Yeah. Hopefully not that long, but possibly. <laughs> Yeah, it's true. Well, that's, I mean, that's that's a great lesson is that, so again, us working through the system is very frustrating at times. But what it does for us is it helps us do the actual work of building relationships, sincere relationships. And you cannot skip that. It's very easy if you have some sort of job to get frustrated with your coworkers and to leave. But guess what? You're probably going to end up in another job where you're equally frustrated with your coworkers and you're going to want to leave and you're going to have this pattern. And the cool thing about our movement is that it's not a religion. It's a movement. It's a family. We call it the family federation. And so even if you leave, uh, you can't leave because we're a family. We're all in a family together. And so we've gone this way and it's not only good for the mission, but it's good for this for, for real actual relationships to be forged. And in order for us to do the deep work of helping, ultimately what we're helping people to do is sexual integrity is all about relationships, relationship with yourself, relationship with heavenly parent and relationship with other people in a healthy way, right? So we're kind of leading by example, by going to something which we could avoid, technically we could avoid working with leadership, but we, we know this is the principled way. And so we don't want to, because if we did, we you guys wouldn't benefit from it. We would eventually serve up something that's insufficient, you know, in terms of our programs, in it would be inauthentic. And so um, just so you know, we're not trying to feel sorry for ourselves, but I think a lot of this work is super beneficial for the high noon contingent at large, not just us. And good for our movement in general to have these difficult conversations. 
Hey, just a quick interruption to tell you about the 40 day high noon challenge. If you're trying to find a way to start living a high noon life today with no shadows and create a radiant blessing, then this simple challenge is for you. We will send you daily lessons from our team that will keep you motivated on your journey. It's totally free guys and you'll get constant content directly to you. Just sign up today at highnoon.org slash challenge. That is highnoon.org slash challenge. All right, back to the show. Thank yeah, you. A lot of times we'll get uh, we'll get requests from leaders who would like to use our PowerPoints for uh, for their students or for their ambassadors for peace or their pastors. And um, we always tell them that that uh, really being authentic is absolutely essential to give these PowerPoints and to, whether it's to ACLC, to CARP, wherever. And so uh, really the the right order is to learn, to practice, and and then to teach. Mm, yeah. It'd be pretty hypocritical if, you know, somebody was talking about heavenly sex and they're not sleeping in the same room with their spouse, you know, <laughs> or they're giving a talk on sexual integrity and they've got some deep, deep, uh, secrets that they're not sharing with anybody and they're not working on, you know, that'd be pretty hypocritical, hypocritical. And that's that, yeah, that's a huge one is that accountability, right. Of being a part of a network of people who aren't just, who aren't, they're not watching you to make sure that you get everything right, but who are there to be kind of a feedback loop of, am I on track or off track based on, how open I can be in front of them and how much am I hiding in front of them? That's what we had as a society when we had tribes and we had close knit communities, like the church in America used to be at the center of a village or a town and everybody would know each other's business because of that. But now people slip through the cracks because they live half their life or more than half their life in isolation. Right. And so they don't have those feedback loops. So when they start having wonky, weird thoughts, where they start doing weird things at night and nobody's watching, they can drift really, really far, sometimes way too far to kind of course correct. And they get into trouble merely because they don't have that feedback loop. And it sounds like, to be honest, that our relationship with the movement is similar, where we have to constantly be in a relationship with our movement in order for us to stay aligned. And so ultimately it's helpful, sometimes frustrating, but that's any family is always rewarding, sometimes frustrating. <laughs> Hopefully rewarding yeah. sometimes if you have a healthy family. So Uncle Dave, what are you excited about? Like that's percolating in the high noon world. Um, what, any projects or anything that's happening that you're really looking forward to? Well, right now I'm excited about crab season. <laughs> yeah. And it's... That's uh, it's kind of interesting because uh, crab season is the it can be the most scary thing for me because I have so much responsibilities and so many uh, so many people counting on me hmm. and I know that I can only do that together with Mitsue. Hmm. I cannot do it without her, and so it's exciting to do something that I can't do without my wife. That is. Uh, I'm not sure. It sounds like it kind of masochistic, but uh, that's that is one thing that excites me. Well, uh, can we unpack that for a second? Because I think that this is it could turn into a platitude is like my better half. I'm nothing without you, this kind of thing. But I would love to understand this more deeply because you do. I've witnessed it year after year take on more and more that exceeds the limit of comfort for sure. Sometimes you push the realm of possible in terms of like your goals and what you want to give for high noon, um, what you want to do with your crab company. So how is this, how is this not possible by yourself? And how, in what way do you actually need Aunt Mitsue? I, I would love to hear that. Yeah. Yeah. Mitsue, her job during the crab season and, and during the tours is to uh, keep David calm, you know, <laughs> and, uh, just, oh, just uh, so many times, Andrew, and, you know, with uh, tragic events with our family and stuff, I've just like been even shaking at mm -hmm. night, 
going to bed and uh and i'll embrace mitzvah and uh it'll be you know just i can i can see i can see hope the i can see how grateful i am how many how much i have to be grateful for and i can put things in perspective which mm. is really important i think it's really important in life that that skill and so do yeah. you attribute that to like how can she calm me down just is i just want everybody to because there's a lot of single people out there right and they're honestly speaking there's so much fear mongering around marriage and i know a lot of people really good people who want the blessing who fear the blessing because it seems like committing is all downside very little upside right that's how the media portrays marriage but what you're presenting is that it is actually your superpower and is what allows you to be the man that you are so in what way do you feel like like she doesn't like it's her touch that just calms your body you're talking about shaking is it her hugs that calm you or like what is it that you're getting from her that you couldn't get from a uh, stuffed animal or you know like or 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 i don't know a friend or yeah a dog or something like that because this is what honestly there's competition for marriage and it is in the form of dogs or a high paying job or whatever but what are you getting actually from not just marriage but the the person that you're married to like your blessing what are you getting from Emmett's way yeah i'm i'm known i'm i can be fully known by somebody and that is so powerful that mm -hmm. is just so powerful to be fully known by one person um yeah it's i think it's absolutely essential for everybody to experience that mm -hmm. so it's the liberation of a lot of feeling like you can be sad or weak or like you don't have all the answers in front of somebody and they will still love you just the same. And there's the power in that is the feedback loop that you are worthy of love, something like that. Yeah. I think it's um, for me and for Mitsue too, I think, I think uh, she represents God to me. Really, her love represents God's love. I learned so much from her and her patience, her grace. It's uh, it's just mind blowing. Um, especially it's two people who are married. You've got this uh, this agreement, and then you know sometimes you. Uh, Maybe sometimes you say something thoughtless or, uh, you know, we're always putting our foot in our mouth, right? <laughs> Guys are especially. My foot just <laughs> leases space in my mouth because it's there so often. <laughs> and it's so amazing if you, you know, since we have a lot of investment, a lot of history uh, and a lot of equity, I would say we have a lot of emotional equity, then uh those things yeah they you know she'll she'll say something about it but it'll be you know uh it won't make it won't make any any big rift between us mm. um yeah and sometimes it's it's something that i think we need to grow um and we want to like run away yeah. but our spouse they cause us to face what we, you know, what we don't like, what's hurting us, what just hurt us so badly. Yeah. And uh, yeah, they, they give us courage to face that with love. Yeah. That's just amazing. That's uh, that's really what we're put on earth for. I feel to, to learn how to digest those, those moments and those circumstances and those people and to, to love them. Yeah, it's it's very true, and also the there's something about uh, nervous systems that, like the calming effect of touching somebody calm, 
So when you're agitated and then you hug Mitsue and she's calm, then you, it's like you can inherit her calm and she can dissolve that tension if she's steadfast in her calm. And that's, there's something unbelievable about that, right? That they can reset your nervous system in a sense, like press the reset button. Um, and that's, you can't get that, you know, anywhere else. Dogs can give you a little bit of calm, but they can't bring peace to your soul. Another person can bring, really like genuinely help you chase away those demons for real. Um, it's very powerful. Yeah. Yeah, and this whole area we deal in in high noon of sex, that is that is the ultimate touch. Yeah. That, um, that you are digesting your spouse's um, hurt and pain and tension, anxiety. And, uh, you know, God created us with this amazing system, uh, this chemistry to be able to uh, you know, connect with with our spouse and be able to have these rejuvenating chemicals going through our bodies mm. and, you know, feel close, feel connection and and love and just be empowered. You know, it's just, uh, it just makes two people, I know definitely that uh, both Mitzi and I, we are so much more powerful individually uh, than we would be without each other and as a couple we're like you know 10 times even more powerful than that you know so yeah yeah it, it's pretty amazing i uh for any of you single uh listeners out there i highly recommend blessing <laughs> <laughs> yeah well can we just stop there for a sec and then unpack because i've been talking to a bunch of young people who are really scared about entering the blessing they're not sure about who to pick you know and so is is you and Amitsue you started out quite different from what I hear she was a real stickler in the beginning kind of a mean captain bossy kind of lady and you were just a kind of a goofball young guy five four years younger or five years younger than her uh, three and a half years younger. Yeah. Three and mm -hmm. a half years. Developmentally, that's like, you know, dog years. So that's like 10 years younger than her. So, uh, you got that going against you, but then somehow you've invested into each other and created this sense of oneness. So is it, is it special that you guys were, it had to be her or did you guys make each other the right person? by investing into each other. Yeah, I think the latter for sure. And I'd like to just touch on you, uh, you uh, were mentioning about young people who are unsure about the blessing, afraid of the blessing, afraid of commitment. And uh, I have learned in business that uh, opportunity, the greatest opportunities, they live and grow and thrive in uncertainty. Mm. in the in the, that realm of uncertainty and love you know relationship with another person you can't control uh what how that person's going to respond all the time you know uh yeah and gosh uh you know women can be so uh well, so choose your next words very carefully <laughs> <laughs> so beautiful <laughs> <laughs> And enticing and mysterious mm. and uh, perplexing sometimes too. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Uh, but that is exactly what makes it so special. What makes marriage so special. It's that uncertainty. Um, so, yeah, if you are considering going into the matching process or getting married uh you are you know are there any are there any like um uh, guarantees i don't think there's any guarantees uh you know you can't absolutely control the other person with with mitzi and i right now there's yes there's guarantees i mean uh you know i would 
be more surprised if the moon fell out of the sky than if Mitzi left or something like that. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we are here like for the long run. You know, there's like no, uh, there's no way out for us. <laughs> To but entangle. it's good, you know. Yeah. Neither one of us want, uh, you know. We would not want a way out, uh, you know. And we know each other. We we trust each other that much. Um, and you know, I've trusted other people who haven't uh, always been, you know, came through on that trust. But with you've got a relationship with Uyanga too that is is so special that you know she's your rock right uh you know unchanging uh and that's that's really the kind of relationship that you can you can have you can you can have a but it doesn't start out that way it starts out uncertain yeah you know very much and it becomes certain it becomes uh it becomes something that um is you can just, uh, you can depend on, you can trust absolutely with your life. That's good advertisement for the blessing, everybody. So it's it's worth the effort for sure. That uncertainty that he's talking about is very palpable for sure because there's so many variables, right? There's sickness, there's um, what if we really don't see eye to eye on certain stuff, um, key issues. Um, that's what I love about the matching is that you have these conversations early on and make sure that at least the key stuff, faith, family, you know, this kind of stuff is, is pretty clear. Are we on the same page? And then based on that, the rest is the unknown is where the good stuff happens. It's scary, but it's where the good stuff happens too. It's where all the excitement is. Nobody's ever ready to be a parent because it's something you've never done before until you do it. So as as ready, you read all the books and all that, it's going to be different than what you think it is because you're not ready. But that's part of it too, going into the unknown. And yeah, it's that's high noon is part of that too. Like our Ascend program will look different for everybody who enters it. We cannot tell you how your journey is going to look because it depends. It depends on how much you have to work through, how much baggage you have, how many, how many years you have under your belt of, you know, doing the wrong thing and how motivated you are and how, how kind of ready you are for the next phase of life. It's all the unknown, but we can guarantee you of a certain outcome if you do a certain amount of work, right? Same with marriage, the blessing, the outcome is inevitable. If you just put in the work, it's love. It's the greatest love that you've ever known, but you got to put in the work. So, yeah, that's that's great. I didn't expect to be talking about your marriage, but this is the great, <laughs> great happenstance, serendipity. Um, so I would love for you to mention, Uncle Dave, all these years ago, 2016, um, when this was all getting underway, high noon, did it... But, like, what did you imagine that it was going to be? And, you know, where we're at now, I know you, like you were saying, you have a very big vision, but did you imagine that we'd be in international territory doing online programs and events and have staff all around the world? Was that, did you see that? Or was it just, you knew that something had to happen and it needed to be international? Well, I knew we'd be in every continent uh, all over the world. Father told us that we need to create a pure love movement. And he said, we're the only ones who can do it. So for many years, you know, I've been trying to realize or to visualize how this could happen. Uh, we've tried to create systems that can support. Remember, we were talking several years ago about exponential growth, right? <laughs> yeah. I think we were trying to uh, uh, create some kind of app or something that would guide people to <laughs> sexual integrity. But we realized really that uh, that uh, that integrity is, it happens through relationship. Restoration happens through relationship. Yeah. The fall happened through relationship. 
and so does restoration. So um, it can't be really, I mean, computer apps and technology, they can be great. Um, but to me, everybody on this planet needs sexual integrity and they absolutely need absolute sex too. Um, they need to understand and practice how to live healthy, happy lives. So how to teach them that and help them to practice it, that's really been our, our goal. Um, and for me, for me, it's not a, a vague concept. Um, I really want the pure love movement to be established in my lifetime, at least the foundation for it. So, yeah, I, if I said that, um, uh, yeah, gosh, Andrew, I never thought we'd be, uh, I thought we'd always remain in, uh, in America or, uh, you know, something like that, uh, you know, we can't, we can't accomplish those goals like that. We've so, given it a lot of thought, like this ripple effect, you know, that we talk about a lot of times, you know, like one person gets something from our programs and then he shares it with another and then another and like that. Um, but how to connect these, like these people and these groups with a heavenly standard. And that's been kind of what we've been uh, what's been challenging us with the chapters, right? That's why you've been going all over the the world uh, and you've been like the Philippines about five times in the last six months. Uh, you know, you, you are going there training and to Europe, uh, Benji to Europe um, and Japan. And we're training these chapter leaders to, uh, to be able to, uh, to know and to practice the high noon virtues and to keep this standard. Yeah. 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 It's, uh, it's an inevitability that we'll be in a town near you soon, but in our own time. So if, you know, in terms of the pure love movement, so I, I was going to ask you, my last question officially was what is one thing you wish everybody listening could understand? Um, and I'd also like to somehow connect that to the, the pure love movement, because it sounds like you, you're pretty clear on that vision, but I, I think a lot of people don't know what that actually means. What does a pure love movement look like? So perhaps you could tie those two things together. Okay. Well, what I, if there's one thing that, uh, I'd like everybody to understand is really how much God loves you. There's so many, we meet so many different uh, people in different circumstances wherever we go. Some people, uh, they they write anonymous questions like, I've fallen, is there hope for me to, can I still get blessed? Or I was sexually abused or raped. Or um, I've got a, a deep pornography addiction for the past 10 years. And they don't know if there's hope. They've given up hope. Mm -hmm. And that, that is so sad. Our message and what I would like everybody to know is that God has always loved you and God will always love you. And no matter what you've done, where you've been, you've got people in your life who want to support you. They want to be there for you. And Heavenly Parent, he has never given up. He has the same vision for your future. So no matter what kind of baggage you've got, or if you've been in a, in a stressed uh, matching or a failed blessing, God wants you to live your happiest life. And there's definitely hope for you. Uh, that is there for you. That's what I'd like everybody to know. Great point. Yeah. And again, even the road to that is through people. You know, you practice experiencing the love of God by experiencing the love of people, unconditional love from people. Where do you think that came from, right? Especially when you're in a dark cave. I haven't heard many people, if anybody, I, I don't know that I've ever heard a single testimony of somebody who is in a really dark place and they just got out kind of completely by themselves. It's just not how we're wired. We need to go back towards the light of God together, hand in hand with somebody else. That's the point. 
Because even if you kind of magically skipped ahead and you were in God's embrace, you'd run back to the cave because that's your familiar place, right? So yeah, to know the love of God is to go together hand in hand with at least one other person, right? Somebody trusted in your life. Now let's get into what's the pure love movement. Uh, please elucidate us a little bit. And then I, I think that'll be the last thing is if you could paint a picture of when you talk about the pure love movement, what are you seeing? Because we were talking a lot about vision this episode. You never, people don't know what you saw in the beginning of high noon. You just had a vision, but we're at the very beginning kind of, of the pure love movement. So give us, what does that look like in your mind? Well, when you ask that, it reminds me of, of a true father at the, at the founding of FFWPU, he he asked the world leaders, what would the world look like if it if it was a world that respected the sexual organs? And uh it would be, wow, you think about that, it would be a totally different world. You know, you'd have people would see each other as they wouldn't see each other as uh, pieces of meat or something to be consumed or objectified. They'd see one another as sons and daughters of God. And they would treat their own self with respect as well. They would have a vision for their sexuality and a vision for the blessing. And this thing, uh, sexuality is is so precious because it's the way that we transmit not only our our DNA, our genes, and all of our our physical characteristics to like uh, into the future, but we just uh, our our spirit and our uh, it's a way that we can live on in the future too. It's such a beautiful thing that connects community, uh, uh, future and past, present and grandparents parents grandchildren it's such a beautiful thing this uh, uh and through the pure love movement I, I see a world that um where the media and hollywood uh they they respect sexuality and they respect love they you know love is something that uh, you know, they sing songs about beautiful love, beautiful, pure love. Brothers and sisters, brothers, uh, you know, being able to uh, to connect with each other and, you know, even like wrestle with each other without, you know, some kind of homophobia, uh, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, and... Yeah, parents and children being able to to talk with each other about about anything and everything. Because when you can talk to somebody about sex and about you know maybe things you've done, mistakes you've made, and you can you can get grace in return. Wow, that is huge. And you can talk about that about anything with that person. You know, so Father said that the sexual organ is the core of the universe. You know what I. I really think that when we get this right, then everything else is going to fall into place. You know, it's like this core was, you know, it started out with a bad core and we fix the core and everything else is going to fall into place. So I really do believe that, that even world peace, you know, um, you know, uh, if, if the, the, Ukrainians and the Russians and the Palestinians and the Israelis, uh, the Jewish people, if they, if they lived with sexual integrity and lived with beautiful families that uh, extol absolute sex, I believe that, you know, they they'd be able to see that in each other and they could respect that. You know, that's something they could respect, and also they're they're going to treat their brothers and sisters with with more respect also because they're going to see them in that same in that same light too i think it it's really going to change 
it's going to change the world when we when we put sex when we have the proper understanding of sex mm. Mm -hmm. yeah i agree it's at the core of everything it's hard to you know we've been hearing that your parents talked a lot about it for many years and i've been repeating it to the extent that i can understand it for years but I'm only really starting to under, really see it, at, like really, uh, you know, understand it even at a base level. It takes time because sex has always been designated to like this hormonal um, physical need. It's just a physical need, right? Instead of a connecting point to past, present, and future and, and a connecting point to God. <laughs> it's just not, it's never, that connection has has not really been there. Not in a healthy way. And so, yeah, I love it. I love it. This is a great vision and a great way to end. So if you want to support creating a pure love culture, then keep it up. Keep it up in your own life. Reach out to us if you need help. We have online programs. We have Uncle Dave, you can call him, or Aunt Mitsue, you can call her. Just keep it up. And we're here to support you. That's our main role is not to be the ones with all the answers, but to be the ones who are always here to support you in your journey, no matter what. So thank you all so much for listening. Thank you, Okadeh, for showing up. I don't know if you guys can see, but he's in a fancy recording studio in his house that, you know, spoiler alert, he's he's recording the audio for Core of the Universe. We're going to make an audio book. And this is our expensive studio in the center of the world. So... Um, yeah, thanks for joining us, Uncle Dave. And um, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Hey, did you know that our team wants to do more events? Well, if you want to bring the High Noon message to your community or group, then let us know and we'll try to work something out. There's a simple application that you can fill out right now at highnoon.org slash invite. And one of our team members will get back to you to see what's possible. That's highnoon.org slash invite. All right, see you in the next episode.